so good evening folks uh, welcome to this episode of the markets that went the uh, episode of the market that went by this week with jst investments so i have with me i have with me today uh, avitesh shah our chief investments officer and our and our head of research anish munka so a quick update as well you know tomorrow we are going to do a deep dive on the banking sector uh, we are we have a webinar scheduled so any of any of you guys are interested do register for that so in today's episode we are going to know what's happening with the z stock the telecom relief measures and what do they mean for the sector the biocon and serum institute deal punawala fincop what has actually happened or to ancillary pls scheme inflation numbers and what do they mean and in the end we'll talk about the chinese developer ever grants problems so first of all you know i would uh, like to hand it over to uh, as who will talk talk about what's going on with the z stock over to you as Yes, you are on mute. Yeah, so he just told me, you know, he's just having some issues with the earphone. So I, I'm, I'm going to start, Anish. Uh, I'm going to start with the telecom relief measures, right? Uh, so just a small uh, background to the telecom sector. You know, we, we all have been speculating, or there has been a lot of speculation that you know the telecom sector is, uh, is heading towards a imminent duopoly. You know, Vodafone Idea has a lot of problems. uh while bharti has been doing a lot of rights issues or uh, divestments or uh, debt raising uh and on the other hand of course jio is there who has raised a lot of capital as well so what really happened in the cabinet meeting was that you know there were a few relief measures announced for the sector so i'm just going to list them out number 1 was the rational rational rationalization of the adjusted gross revenue definition so what is actually going to happen is that prospectively 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 meaning from here on the non telecom revenue will be excluded number 2 uh, the spectrum tenure has been increased from 20 to 30 years and the surrender of spectrum will be permitted after 10 years of course with a defined spectrum surrender charge what is also the main announcement that came from the cabinet meeting was that there is a four year moratorium which has been allowed for telecom companies in and they can avail this moratorium to pay off their agr dues so what has actually happened is that uh, you know companies which are extremely stressed such as vodafone idea can avail this moratorium and after 4 years they can pay off their agr dues of course now now the 4 year period uh, of this moratorium will be charged right so mclr plus 2% is something that is going to be charged by the government so there are no free lunches in the market so when i talk about vodafone idea right so uh, vodafone has a agr due of around 62000 crores and the spectrum spectrum dues are uh, are more than a lakh crore when i look at bharti the situation is much better their agr dues are 27000 crores and the spectrum dues are around 50000 crores now what has really happened is that uh, bharti airtel uh, has been on a fundraising spree uh, recently they have approved the 21000 crores right issue and just last year they had in 2019 they had raised 25000 crores now one thing that bharti airtel has done well is that you know they have a lot of assets they have uh, stakes in indus tower they have uh, stakes in africa so i feel that so we feel that you know uh, bharti airtel may f- uh, come out unscathed uh, we feel that maybe they may, they may not take the moratorium because after all you have to pay interest on the moratorium period as well what of an idea on the other hand it seems that you know uh, okay it's like kicking the can down the road you know uh, if the duopoly was there a year or two from here on i think it may get delayed by say four or six years because you know the four year moratorium period and that's about it you know uh, the problems for vodafone idea are not going to end very soon uh, their arpus their subscribers everything has been falling uh, you know they uh, the, the vodafone and idea merged in 2018 to fend off the competition from jio and stay competitive but honestly speaking uh, in three years they haven't done much to show Uh, their subscribers have halved from Q1 FY19 to Q1 FY22. Uh, revenues have fallen from 13,000 crores per quarter to 9,000 crores per quarter now. And uh, I mean that's about it. Their debt is at uh, over over two lakh uh, crores. Uh, the company's uh, net worth is a negative 74,000 crores. So I mean honestly speaking, uh, I don't see how uh, uh, we see the survival of Vodafone Idea. Of course, I mean they they're going to avail the moratorium and they're going to survive for a few more years. 
but that's about it uh, let's see how the industry develops uh, bharti airtel has been extremely aggressive and uh, bullish about the uh, increasing arpus so if you see on the minimum plans that have been uh, that have been going on in the market so uh, there was a very famous 49 rupees plan which was the minimum plan uh, used by all telcos now it has been discontinued and it has been hiked up to 80 rupees uh we have also seen jio uh, cut down the validity days of their plans by 10 to 15% so of course you know one hike a few hikes of uh, a few price hikes have been already taken uh, either through direct price hikes or indirectly indirectly by reducing the validity days and that's about it uh, let's see how the industry uh, pans out and how if whether we see a duopoly very soon with that you know uh, i am done with my telecom part i'll just hand it over to as now Who's going to speak about what is really happening with the CE stock and inside it? Yeah. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Audible, right? Yeah, but there's a lot of disturbances. Uh, so on the CE entertainment stock, this uh, is. Yes, PSO. you have a lot of disturbances. Uh, yeah, one second, just one second. Yeah, I can go ahead with Biocon then. In the meanwhile. Yeah, Anish, you go ahead, please. Yeah. Yes. So. Uh, what happened with the uh, Serum plus Biocon Biologics deal? So it's a like a strategic alliance where it's a non-cash deal. So where Biocon Biologics, uh, Biocon will be giving fifteen percent of its stake in Biocon Biologics to Serum Life Sciences, which is currently worth at uh, worth at five thousand three hundred crores, and for that they will get access to ten crore vaccines annually for the next fifteen years. So every year they will get ten crore vax. vaccines which they will have the commercialization rights will they they will be the one who will be distributing these vaccines across the world and uh, so firstly uh, with respect to the pnl uh, they will get a profit share from these vaccines and uh, uh, even after the profit share that they have to give uh, they that they have to give to serum they will continue to make 30 to 35% ebitda margins as per the management which is in line with their current biosimilars business so that is a creative secondly you can see that the covid vaccines is not going anywhere uh, like if we uh, check out the emerging economies only 2 to 3% of the population has got the vaccines uh, which are required as at this point in time and uh, even in developed economies uh, there are booster shots and other things that will be required continuously so it continues to be a very lucrative business at least for the next 3 to 4 years as much as we see until unless there is too much competition which uh, which currently it's not that viable because globally no no one is able to produce these vaccines at such a large scale then biocon for example will be getting approximately 10 crore covid vaccines for the next 3 years if we take an approximation and if we take a lower band of 300 rupees per dose they will be making 3000 crores of revenue on a yearly basis and with that like they will be making 1200 to 1300 crores of ebitda so just taking this into account uh, to some extent that 5300 crores uh, worth of biocon biologic stake that they are giving to serum life sciences that makes some sense then then there's more because when covid situation will clear off and uh, we would no longer require the booster shots that they are saying uh, and the scare also goes away after some years then biocon will also get a commercialization rights of the serums upcoming portfolio uh, so whatever new vaccines they will develop with respect to what is viable in a business sense biocon will take those vaccines and they will distribute it and uh, as per them the margins should remain at that price because these uh, manufacturers they make a lot of money in vaccines so vaccines are a very high margin product the problem with the vaccine business is the volumes because sometimes uh, you get very high volumes come as you have seen in the covid pandemic and sometimes you don't see revenues for years so that's a problem other than that uh, as in when because uh, because serum already has a very strong portfolio so we don't see that as a problem additionally so biocon will also be developing novel antibodies which are biologics which are extremely complex to make so they is basically they are going the innovator side and uh, there they will target infectious diseases like dengue and hiv 
so previously biocon was just present in non communicable diseases now they are going into communicable diseases also additionally this is more of an optionality game because uh, any investment done for innovation there's a very high chance that nothing will come back so there this is the optionality part of the whole deal that they have gone through uh, so i want to just understand make you understand about biocon's history of how it has developed into the innovation focused company that it is currently so what do you mean by an innovation focused company it just means that there is a very high entry barrier to what you are doing so that the competition that you will expect when you are selling your product will be much lower and that is what biocon has done throughout its history so in the 1980s to 1990s they made enzymes in the 20 2000s they made fermentation apis no one in india was doing it at the time only china was the player and no one else second thirdly they they started in 2010 they started working on insulin in the mid of the last decade they ventured into monoclonal antibodies and fusion proteins so just hearing these names you you get shell shocked as to what are these but if you go and watch some youtube videos as to how these compounds work then you will know the complexity that we are dealing with here it's not something that indian generics players are very famous for and now as we see that in the 2020s they have pivoted again to vaccines which is again not an easy job so who better to collaborate with than serum which is the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world and brings with it decades worth of vaccine development experience and that's not it biocon's research and manufacturing infrastructure will also be leveraged and uh, anyone who's tracking the business knows that they do have a lot of excess capacity currently because the biosimilars business is not ramping up to extent that we thought currently so that works perfectly for them that's like a hedge for their biosimilars business if any risk comes there then it's particularly very easily hedged because the revenue starts from these vaccines by h2 of fi23 and uh, it's all contractual so there is sort of like a annuity model and uh, as you will, as these guys will most probably be selling in uh, the emerging markets so there is a very little risk of compliance also so again it's the optionalities are endless because two jewels of india have collaborated together so these are companies which indians are very proud of because what they have achieved on a global scale very few companies globally even think about that so with that i i'm uh, ending my biocon serum discussion yes thank that you anish you. Uh, AS, AS, uh, can you just say something i just want to check your audio yeah hi how are you yeah perfect so as why don't you tell us about what has happened with the z stock you know the fall the rise and the, all the things that are happening there yeah yeah uh, on z entertainment uh, as we had seen the, earlier this week the stock was up 40% in one trading session uh, what has really happened is that um, investco uh, first of all i i uh, one of the proxy firms uh, i i uh, ns had uh, suggested to the shareholders that on the agm which was earlier this week shareholders should uh, Uh, vote against the re-election of the uh, existing directors. One of them was Mr. Manish Tokhani. Uh, seeing this, uh, both of those direct- directors have resigned from the board. Uh, that is the first point that is there. The second point that is there, there is that uh, Invesco Oppenheimer uh, and China Global One Fund, which together are the biggest shareholders in Z Entertainment, ha- uh, have called a EGM, Extraordinary General Body Meeting, where they say they want to remove Puneet Goenka as the director of the company because they feel uh, that uh, there is a lot of corporate governance issues that are going on inside the company, and uh, Puneet Goenka is not the uh, right person to lead the company. As you already know, in Z Entertainment, the promoter shareholding has been. as low as 3.99% there is no identifiable promoter as such inside the company and the company is a prime target for a uh, takeover bids that are there so what is the consequence of all of this that is going on because of this board room battle z is now a prime takeover candidate who is going to acquire z um, there are many candidates such as sony reliance all of them are wanting uh, to grab up a pie of z z is business continues to be very very strong in the coming days as the egm takes place and uh, if mr puneet goenka does resign does uh, resign or is he is made to go uh, 
uh, the stock will be then uh, take over target and then the contours of the deal, deal will decide how the stock price moves so it is a very risky stock to be in be very very careful and uh, exercise risk management that is there that's it okay. sure so uh, the next question for you as is on fino uh, punawala fincorp you know we have been hearing news that you know when it got converted from magma to punawala fincorp people were calling it the next bajaj finance and it was the hot stock but then with all that has happened what are your thoughts on it and can you just explain in short what has really happened there yeah Uh, every stock is not the next hdfc bank every stock is not the next bajaj finance uh, to be a bajaj finance you have to have the pedigree of bajaj finance just because mr punawala has come and invested in a company that does not mean that it will become the next bajaj finance that is the first point that is there uh, formerly punawala fincorp was known as magma fincorp magma fin fincorp had a very disastrous run they had a uh, auto financing business that was there which was doing very horribly before mr punawala came in and uh, bought over the company so what really has happened is that uh, it seems that sebi has uncovered just before announcing the deed publicly in the market it uh md and other related entities of punawala have uh, taken positions in the uh, magma fincorp stock and just as the uh, uh, deal was announced uh, they make spectacular returns as high as 15 16 crores uh, that uh, that they had made in the stock that is there the stock shot up from 40 rupees where it was trading before this crisis to now around 160 rupees that is there so it is a very big breach of cg uh, corporate governance that is there uh, pune wala uh, uh, guys cannot be trusted with whatever is going on that is the first point the md of the company has resigned uh, that is the right step to, right thing to do uh, now you have to wait and see who is going to come and lead the business uh, anyway uh, pune wala fincorp does say that they want to grow their uh, assets under management aum uh, by 3x in the next three years which is not a very easy thing to do everybody does not end up uh, lending like bajaj finance bajaj finance in 6 years from 2012 to 2016 17 used to grow at 50% but bajaj finance was very smart in managing their asset quality not everybody will be that smart in uh, managing their asset quality just because a lender is very small that does not mean that you uh, it will become the next bajaj finance it has to first exhibit qualities uh, as bajaj finance that they are able to maintain asset quality then you can go ahead and say that it will become next to catch finance otherwise why is speculating on every small lender to be the next hdfc or the next bajaj finance uh, totally will not make sense sure thank you yes uh, anish over to you uh, why don't you walk us through the auto ancillary pli scheme please yes so the auto pli scheme is the total the total incentive that the government is giving to auto companies is approximately 26000 uh, 26000 crores and uh, which is uh, lower than the originally intended 57000 crores so what has happened here because this scheme came out 6 months before and uh, not many decision making was done while it was going through the process this is because petrol diesel and comp- uh, cng vehicles were excluded from the scheme so how will it work so manufacturers have to invest in the capacity enhancement and then will walk away with benefits when the sales will come so you have to generate sales from the capacity expansion that you do from the pli scheme to earn from it uh, the incentives usually range from 13 to 16% of the selling price for a oem and uh, 8 to 10% for non ev components and 16 to 13 to 16% for ev components so companies would have to invest nearly 300 to 2000 crores over the next 5 uh, years uh, starting from fy22 so it has already started to get the incentives and uh, basically it's intended for manufacturers who are going to invest uh, in advanced automotive technologies particularly evs and hydrogen cell uh, batteries but uh, currently very few people are doing hydrogen cell so particularly it's extremely focused on evs and uh, only on players who will be manufacturing evs in india and then exporting them to outer countries foreign countries and also for the automotive component manufacturers which are ancillaries uh, but that is uh, that is uh, extended to even the non ev components but 
the incentive would be would be a little bit lower so we can see that the government has already laid a very strong foundation for the rapid adoption of evs in india so uh, you can see it directly like manufacturers have also gotten the attractive incentives and consumers are also getting it through fame subsidies particularly the fame subsidies are only uh, valid as of now for the two wheelers but uh, slowly and steadily we might see that even passenger vehicles uh, will uh, will gain the fame subsidies uh, and it can also be visible in ola's recent numbers that ola has posted 1100 crores worth of confirmed orders in the last two days so so this is actually unprecedented not only for the auto industry but it is also one of the highest single day sales for a single product in india's e-commerce history so is this a game changer is what is the big question but we can't really say at this point in time because we don't know that when the deliveries will come and will the deliveries be really made at the time that they are projecting then will the customers get what they have ordered because there has been no testing that has been done by the customers they have directly ordered it and what will be the convenience of charging because when i'm buying it and i'm not able to charge it nearby from my home and uh, for that also it takes a lot of time to charge 3 to 4 hours to charge so how viable is that and how rapidly customers get used to that so these are the things that we actually don't know but even if you are very cautious as to what will happen which we are then it's better to go through the auto ancillaries which cater to these electric vehicles or actually stay agnostic to ev so if ev comes they will just uh, give the same parts for example tires for example lighting so these are the things that we are focusing on and uh, also one thing that is very important to say here because ev is always supported all over the world ev is supported by significant government incentives and that is what is driving ev's adoption because what we have seen in norway last year that electric car sales plunged 80% when the incentives were removed so we can't really be extremely positive because a lot of things haven't been answered india goes through a power deficit india doesn't have electric electric vehicle infrastructure at this point in time and who is investing in electric vehicle infrastructure everybody is saying that everybody is releasing press releases about investing in infrastructure but currently in ground what we see that it's it's to it's a little bit far and uh, everything will get tested with time so we are focused on finalizing everything uh, compiling everything uh, we would say that auto ancillaries which which already are ev agnostic and secondly auto ancillaries which are also big enough to uh, spend big on the pli scheme because uh, if they can then 16 to 15 to 16% of incentives could do a great deal for india to become a manufacturing hub for these parts so large automotive uh, ancillaries which will be able to spend uh, big amounts of money which have the balance sheet to do that in the next 5 years will gain a lot from this initiative yeah back to you ak thank you anish so anish last question for you and the last question for this space before we open it up for q and a is on the ever grand problems that is happening in china and one more one more interesting thing that you had uh, tweeted was this anish you know wherein you had retweeted a video of uh, this chinese developer uh, and all of the buildings were being demolished because you know the the company went bankrupt yeah so could you just speak on both of these things thank you yeah th- that bu- uh, those buildings were from evergrand so let's let's see what is this crisis all about oh okay yeah. <laughs> so uh, i guess most of you would uh, never have had heard of evergrand before this uh, constant uh, uh, to social media posts have started uh, you know coming all across from twitter to facebook everywhere you see there is a talk about evergrand collapsing so let's understand actually what is happening so evergrand is the second largest real estate developer in china and uh, it no doubt it's a systematically important one so what we have seen is that in the last 4 years their stock price is down by more than 90% and uh, their debt is currently trading at uh, 30 cents on the dollar so basically there is a 70% discount on their debt 
so what the bond markets are saying that there is a 70% chance or uh, seven, that 70% or more chance that Evergrande would not be paying back their loans. And uh, the debt is also rated at a, as a high-risk junk bond. So why is it important for us? Because Evergrande owns 57,000 acres of land in China. To get you an idea, even the largest developers in India own nearly two to 3,000 acres of land. And that too Evergrande owns in 234 cities in China. So you can imagine the size with which we are dealing with. In, uh, and because real estate is a very capital intensive industry, so most of the developers work with a lot of debt. And that is also the case with Evergrande. So currently they have a net debt of $82 billion. And also that is not the true picture. Because uh, when you are taking the net debt, you are also taking a real estate property value as an investment and uh, you are decreasing it from your gross debt. So the real picture is much more worse. Because if the prices of the real estate that it is uh, factoring in goes down, then you can imagine the amount of debt that will balloon to. Other than that, it also has $128 billion of account payables on its balance sheet. So that is basically the amount that it owes to thousands of other businesses in China, that small businesses, big businesses, large businesses. Uh, it spans across because it's the second largest developer in China. You can imagine it has a balance sheet of $300 billion. So basically it's uh, more than the loan book of SBI. So, so what happens? What, what could be the potential scenario? What is happening currently? So Evergrande has said that uh, they will not be able to pay back the interest that it owes in this month. And they haven't been paying uh, salaries to their 120,000 employees. Uh, they are saying that uh, it's better that you take properties uh, for the amount that you owe us. Because they are just, they are cash, they are facing a, the biggest cash crunch that uh, this company can potentially face. Uh, so what is the worst and the best case scenario in this point in time? So what we see as the best case scenario is, so we shouldn't underestimate that there is a one party authoritarian regime in China. And that is a very big bull case because they won't allow an economic catastrophe as it could lead to the end of CCP. They will not leave a single stone unturned trying to resolve this issue. And uh, they will put their full might. Uh, so just imagine the second most powerful government will put its full might to solve this issue. And uh, if they are not able to solve this now, they will kick the can down the road by 5 to 10 to 15 years. That's what governments normally do. So what could be the worst case? Just imagine the amount of money that I'm telling you, the total... Uh, the approximates that other brokerages have come up with, it's approximately 300 billion that this company owes to other people. Uh, so, and who are these other people? There are 130 banks involved and 132 non-banks involved across the world. So you can imagine that the contagion effects that would take place when this sort of a situation actually happens. They default and uh, uh, most of their assets are already illiquid. So even if they go into liquidation, how will these people gain back their money? Just imagine the amount of uh, risks that it will create across the whole system. The uh, amount of uh, small MSMEs, hundreds of thousands of MSMEs who uh, are dependent on them paying them back, uh, who are dependent on Evergrande paying them back will not happen. So what is... To be honest, like no one can quantify this at this point in time. So we are actually just tracking all the developments that are happening in the space and are a bit cautious as to because something, for example, COVID. COVID in its initial months was ignored. Nobody used to give it that much value. Like foreign, uh, for example, what the current economy, what the current markets, global markets are doing with Evergrande. So if this increases and CCP doesn't do anything, which at this point they are not, so then it could be a big contagion risk for each and every investor across the world. Yes, AK, done. Sure, Anish. So, you know, Anish, on a related, on a related note, you know, uh, China has seen one of the world's 
uh, fastest urbanization you know in 1978 just 18 20% of the population was in cities it has grown to 64% last year so what china really did was that you know they went on this uh, massive aggressive uh, infrastructure uh, building spree and what they did in this uh, uh, in this goal was that you know they built a lot of mega cities and a lot of these mega cities now are just vacant so uh, you know the the sole reason why these mega cities exist today are for taking photographs or for weddings so you know it's just it's just very scary <laughs> yeah. so uh, yeah thanks anish for the detailed insight and thanks as as well so guys we'll open it up for q and a i already see a lot of requests so i'll just start adding speakers hi rohit ji good evening your question please Question: I was hearing you on the electric vehicle side. I, uh, you know, this uh, there is a small confusion in my mind. In electric vehicles, uh, the incumbent players in the two-wheeler side or on the auto ancillary sides are not doing any kind of pivoting or uh, or trying to innovate their business model. Where whether it comes to the battery swapping or going to the or the battery charging stations or trying to uh see the replacement of lithium ion so on and so forth it is the new age economy uh players small startups who are trying to uh fill up the gap over there right which is very surprising that india has especially north has one of the top line auto ancillary units uh but nobody innovated uh so this is very uh, the incumbent players are trying to delay or still not uh understanding the magic of uh, the ev space and second is uh, uh, the crude oil imp- from a government point of view where they want crude oil substitution import uh, bills to come down if lithium ion is going to be imported from china then it is a left pocket right pocket how do you see this uh, why will government keep on supporting it if it's the crude oil replacement going from uh, from say gulf countries from iran the billing is going to china say thank you yeah i'll take the first question and the second part uh, as could you take that yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead yes so the first thing like if you'll see all the auto oems like what they have gone through in the last 5 6 years firstly they are not being able to sell so the volumes have been stagnant in the normal vehicles that they are selling then there has been a nbfc credit squeeze that happened with uh, which caused a lot of trouble on the buyer side then there were higher taxes on fuel basically in some extent or the other more expensive insurance cost increased taxation from the government in every sense road tax or some xyz tax then there was a cost of ownership which went up because they had to do a lot of investments in bs6 and then again there is something uh, known as shared mobility like ola and uber so these are the things that are putting a lot of pressure on the old oems or old ancillaries balance sheets already they ha- most of these players have already invested a lot into their businesses and are not seeing the returns on capital that they were thinking that were required when they were making the investments so you can imagine now government is coming and saying to all of these guys that you have to put ev infrastructure you have to work on ev battery technology then you also have to develop a ev vehicle and then you have to sell these vehicles so you know it's not it's not viable for these guys matlab they should just shut down their business and go away because these businesses can't invest so much money every year so that's why most of the old and most of the uh, the legacy players as you might say it they won't invest a lot of money into these uh, new age company new age uh, vehicles or new age infrastructure firstly infrastructure is at not at all viable until unless you reach a certain amount of volumes which is which will happen even if we start uh, ramping up ev it will take a lot of time it will take uh, yeah. most of the infrastructure across the world is not at all profitable even when the adoption rate has increased to 10% so you can imagine the amount of problems that it will create on the balance sheet of these players so we can't expect them to invest in the infrastructure and also most some of the, these players have already started investing in the technology but they don't see 
the ev adoption to happen at that of, at that at such a fast rate because at the end of the day it's a chicken and egg problem the what is happening with ola is more of a current short term fanfare with the understanding that we have at this point in time and with the infrastructure that india has we'll see how it develops and that's why we are constantly seeing this space because uh, most of this uh, the new investments that are happening uh, is from the startup space and if it doesn't pick up then it would have dire consequences on their balance sheet there was more uh, other players who are much more experienced uh, experienced about how the indian mindset works they are not investing I- yes you can move to your part no no uh, what i want to add here is that ev is the most best understood space that is there uh, around uh, people behave as if ev is going to come tomorrow definitely not ev is not going to come number one thing that you should be observing is that is the government putting power infrastructure in place um, i am not seeing the government ramping up power production number one thing to uh, do uh, if you want to really move towards ev is to uh, ramp up power production india continues to be a power deficit country according to the power ministry we were at power deficit of 0.5% over the last year if uh, we are not able to just uh, fulfill our power requirements how are we going to supply electricity for evs that is the first point the second point is it is very wrong to say that uh, the incumbent players are not investing in uh, evs if you see today maruti is testing out its wagon r that is there on the ev side of it but the technology today is completely unviable you cannot expect a mass produced car to get uh, charged for 4 hours if that's the case there will be huge lines that will be uh, outside the uh, power charging stations that are there the current technology is completely unviable that is there uh, either a fast charging lithium ion battery comes up or uh, you have dc chargers where dc chargers are able to charge the uh, uh, charge the batteries in 30 minutes so this is a job of a, a startup that is there Where a startup will discover some technology or the other that is there, which will eventually be taken over by o- OE an OEM who is a cash-rich OEM who has the ability and the uh, money power to fund that uh, production that is there. So that is the first point that is there on the uh, OEMs that is there. The second point is definitely yes, the lithium-ion battery will not be cheap. The lithium-ion battery people think that uh, when electricity will come. uh evs will come uh, it is going to be out of the world no absolutely not first of all generating electricity will be a major headache 60% of today's electricity is through coal most of it is imported uh, it will add to the current account deficit that is there india is not anywhere in wind energy nor in um, solar energy that is there coal will continue to remain uh, a major uh, source of energy that is there which is adding to the current account deficit similarly with the lithium ion battery lithium ion uh, china is getting a lot of uh, control over the world's lithium uh, reserves that are there again there is a problem on current account deficit then the other problem that is there once gst once petroleum uh, finishes off major source of government revenues will also go away then the government will come and char- and put uh, taxes on electricity that is there so this ev game is not really very easy it will take time to play out and we have to really see what happens sure right okay yeah uh, i will add a new speaker so we have one more rohit so uh, mr rohit mahajan ji uh, your question please hello rohit ji your question please went on mute uh, please go ahead i can some other person yeah hi hi avish your question please added you as a speaker uh, avish your question please Hello everyone. Uh, so my question was, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. what do you feel about the waste management and the waste management industry as a whole, and the players which are there right now listed in India? Like, uh, uh, very few are listed, and about the entire waste management, and specifically about the waste management and how it is going to do uh, coming forward in the future. 
uh, okay avish thanks for that question uh, waste management is a very big industry and does have a lot of scope uh, as such uh, antenny waste management uh, we are not tracking so will not be able to comment specifically on the stock however uh, on antenny on uh, the waste management industry it is a very good industry uh, with a lot of scope for companies to make money there go ahead take the next question please yeah so three fun charts your question please three fun charts your question please i have uh, made you as a uh, made you a speaker wait i'll add another one oh uh, hardy i have made you a speaker your question please hello yeah hardy hello. your, your question please audible? yeah we can hear you yeah, yeah my perfectly. question is yeah. recently i was listening to uh, this fada chairman he was talking about uh, the chip shortage the semiconductor shortage i wanted to understand the impact of that in a very short term uh, the short term impact on on of this issue on automobile players like mahindra and mahindra or uh, bajaj or maruti for that matter Uh, he was saying that this festive season is not going to be the festive season the demand is there but there's a huge problem in supply and i was also listening to rajiv bajaj who said uh, the higher end bike uh, where in the margin is very high they are going to take a hit because of the chip shortage and they don't see that problem is going to get solved at least within next 6 months so i want to know your views uh, on this thanks yeah i'll take that question so the thing about semiconductor shortage is it's not going to get resolved by next year so that is very clear across the world and due to which all the automobile oem manufacturers uh, that be across the world and i am specifically talking about passenger vehicles because they require the largest amount of semiconductors as a percentage of total cost all of them are going to face a lot of production issues uh, recently i was listening to uh maruti suzuki and they said that they are having an all time low inventory levels of just 15 days on a normal festival season they used to have 35 to 45 days of inventory with the dealers but currently they don't have it and that will create uh, a lot of supply side the, 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 because of those supply side challenges the production is not up to the limit and it will show in the festival numbers of most of these companies and we have to live with that because this situation is just not getting resolved and it's getting worse by the day but uh, there there will be light uh, at the end of the tunnel and hopefully we'll see that by the end of this year by FY22 uh, the situation starts gradually normalizing and uh, the volumes will go back to normal currently what we see that because of this most of the oems are able to pass on the price increases because there is a there is a substantial amount of demand uh, with respect to personal mobility and other things which are fueling the demand and revised economy economic growth is picking up across the space is what all the lenders are telling us so what we see is that the the problems that they were facing on the commodity side is now getting passed on so that's the only positive that we can see here on but then you have to see what can happen over the next 2 3 years and that's how you determine your investments so you you can find a lot of good opportunities in this space just because of that so yeah that is it cool thanks thanks rd uh satvik you are a speaker can you unmute yourself and ask a your question please yeah can you hear me now yeah perfectly yeah uh, my i mean i have two questions like uh, maybe they are out of context but uh, please don't mind first one is like regarding the ipos like there are many recent ipos coming out so what what generally should one look into while applying for an ipo and the second question is like the market is touching new highs every day so how should one go about it 
like if someone is doing an sip it's fine but if someone is someone wants to enter the market at this point of time so what's the best entry strategy sure so as i'll take the first one and you can take the second one uh so satvik uh, of course on ipos uh, what one needs to do is read the drhp the draft red herring prospectus so here's a fun fact you know during the 2010 ipo boom uh, all the ipos that listed right so one out of two ipos are below their issue price today and one out of those four companies are delisted they do not exist anymore so what really happens is that you know uh there are going to be a lot of bad apples because ipos in nature are are, are such that you know it is kind of a mad run right so uh, any any company uh, with questionable questionable fundamentals or any company that does not need, need uh, any money at all they are just here to play the valuations game come and exit their uh, positions in the company so as an investor you should be really careful to not fall in the narrative trap you know uh, Uh, in in the past year we have seen so many companies get listed uh, this year is going to be the highest ever for ipo fundraising in the history of the indian capital markets but of course you know in the midst of all this there are going to be some good companies uh, uh, you know some ipos have created immense wealth uh, for people who have held on to them for years so please read the drhp form your own view don't fall in the narrative trap uh, don't listen to anybody else yeah and as over to you yeah on the market side of it uh, market valuations continue to remain extremely aggressive uh, across sectors valuations are very very expensive uh, having said that uh, if you are uh, doing a mutual fund sip you should never stop it uh, come what may uh, market rises market falls uh, sip a good mutual fund for uh, next 10 15 20 years you should be okay uh, if you want to uh, go ahead and invest in a stock you should look at the valuations if the valuations are extremely punchy you should be very very careful which is the case across all se- most sectors not all most sectors as of now uh, here and there the companies will be will provide value but as a whole on the market the market continues to be extremely expensive thank you thank you satvik uh abish uh, you are a yes. speaker uh so sir yeah, recently yeah. i was reading about the container shortage and the prices uh, which has hi- hiked a lot uh, in the last two years specifically in the last one year and uh, about h- uh, how do you feel that uh, this container shortage would last for like the near term pro- is is a near term problem or yeah, it will last for a long run i will take that uh... look the container shortage uh, will definitely last for another one year is the best guess right now a situation will evolve and then we will have to take a call uh, but a lot of companies who are exporting out of india are complaining of very high uh, freight charges that are there which a lot of them are doing their best to pass on to the end customer that is there uh, but beyond the point it is not really very possible and it is in some cases also resulting in demand loss that is there for a lot of companies So yes, uh, it is very fluid situation, and you have to continuously keep monitoring it. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Avish. Uh, so guys, that was the last question for the evening. Uh, you know, we we had planned to end it at nine forty itself, uh, but yeah, we have already stretched it. Uh, don't worry, we'll keep on doing this every Friday now. Uh, the response has been great this time, and uh, thanks for asking a lot of great questions. Thanks for your time, and take care. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you everyone good night